in one sense that was an incredible time of worship, but I want to remind, especially those of you who are guests, maybe first or second time guests, this really is what we do every week. We read scripture about the risen Lord and the greatness of God. We pray that scripture. We sing songs about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus and the greatness and the glory of God. We preach sermons about that. We invite people to come and follow this Jesus. And so this is kind of what we do every week. So yes, there's always a little extra energy on Easter, but there's not a different plan here. Um, We believe that Jesus is enough, and we believe He is the treasure, and we just come and get together and brag on Him and exalt Him and see what happens after that. And so uh, we're thankful that you're here today. John chapter 10 is where we've landed in our kind of systematic progression through the book of John. We're trying our best to cover a chapter a week. There is so much great stuff in there. We acknowledge up front that we can't cover it all, but uh, that is the plan. And we just cover what we feel like the Lord's leading us to cover in that particular week. Originally in the kind of the preaching plan for the year, uh, I had left Easter and Christmas open, figuring that we might end up in another text. But the more I looked at John chapter 10, it was a perfect Easter text as Jesus talks about laying down his life and taking it up again. So it made sense just to continue where we are. Uh, Just as we talked about a regular service, it's pretty much how we do Easter. I do want you to know, though, that one thing we try to do no matter when we meet is make sure that if somebody came in who was not a follower of Jesus, that they would not only hear about his greatness, but they would literally hear about the good news of the gospel, the life and death and resurrection of Christ. So understand, uh, I think we would all agree, no matter if you got drug here or not, you would agree that we live in a broken world. So all you have to do is, you know, get online and, and look at the news or TV or whatever and realize that we're in a broken world and we're broken people within that broken world. And people try all kind of different ways to solve that problem. Everybody is trying, in a sense, to solve that problem. They may try dangerous things like substance abuse or immorality or things like that to fix the brokenness. Or they might try neutral things to fix the brokenness. That might be sports or hobbies or shopping, materialism. They may try good things to fix the brokenness like family and possibly even career or even church or some sort of religion to fix their brokenness. And as most of you, if not all of you, could give testimony to, that is not a successful plan. It doesn't work. In fact, the other day, as I heard somebody talking about that, they likened it uh, to kind of a bungee cord. You may even feel like you're fixing your brokenness as you run out from the brokenness toward immorality or substance abuse or career or things or family or religion. But it always just seems to bring you kind of careening back toward the brokenness because it's unsuccessful, even though for a season it may make you feel okay. In the end, it leaves brokenness. And that brokenness has been around ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They had a perfect environment. They were part of God's perfect creative design. And then when they sinned, brokenness entered the world. And so not only were they broken, we've inherited their sin nature. In fact, King David, the way he wrote it in the Psalms was from his mother's womb. That has been his kind of plight. That's been his direction in life. And we've kidded around here before. In fact, even now, if you doubt that we're born with a sin nature, for one, head to the nursery. Probably in general, that's a good enough call. But if it's not, you get a couple of two-year-olds in there and you give them one toy. And you see whether or not they have a nature that is selfish, whether they have a nature that desires that. And so we don't have to be taught those things. We don't have to be taught to lie to protect ourselves when we do get in trouble. We just inherit that selfish nature. So because of sin, we're in a broken world and people do try to fix it. But God, being the loving, all-powerful God that he is, he came up with the only solution that could be had. And that solution was sending the perfect son of God, Jesus Christ, into this broken world. He took on flesh. He became Emmanuel, God with us. And then he did live a perfect life sinless, lived the life that we couldn't live. And then he died on a cruel cross, taking God's punishment for our sin. But then he rose again. We just got through singing that over and over and over again in different ways, different lyrics, but he rose again in power. And so people who now 
will trust in that, put their faith in that, they can be saved. And it's, it's not easy to do in a sense because something in our human nature desires to do something. We desire to jump through some hoops. That's why every religion you see has a bunch of things, a bunch of lists of do's and don'ts that you have to do to earn God's favor. And if we're not careful, even in a Christian church, we can at least subconsciously come up with, you need to do this, 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 and this, and don't do this, 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 and this. We're implying that you need to work your way toward God's favor. And that's not the gospel. That's religion, which really makes it no different than other religions. It ends up being a, a moral code that will leave you in hell. And we can put a Christian name on it if we want to, but it's not the gospel. The gospel is nothing we can do, but only what he's done. And so when you trust in that, then you are saved. And that's good news. And he changes you from the inside out. You get a new nature, just like we saw the picture in baptism today. Yes, you were buried with Christ in baptism, but you're raised to walk in newness of life. A new creation with different want-tos and different desires. And while we're on this earth, we live that out imperfectly but yet we're always heading toward Christ's likeness. We're becoming more like him. And obviously that process can be sped up, even though it's a spiritual process. In general, when we're in the word and we're around God's people and we're talking to him and listening to him and praising his name, we're consumed by the person and work of Jesus. Then we tend to become more and more like him. The Bible describes it as we become the fragrance of Christ. We can have the mind of Christ and the attitude of Christ and once we really get saved, trusting in the finished work of Christ, and once we start to grow to be more like Christ, the good news is he helps us grow to be like him, and then he kind of catapults us right back out in the brokenness. We don't just come hang out in the holy huddle. Oh, let me back up. Some people, and sadly, some churches decide that's what we ought to do. Because we live in a broken world, let's stay in here. And there is a great feeling being in here around believers and singing praises to his name and hearing the word. But he didn't do that so we would come and just sit and soak it in and sour. He does it so we can get filled up and be sent out, as Andy talked about and prayed, to the dangerous and dirty places, to the places where we may be uncomfortable, back in the broken world. And it may start out with your family and your friends and your school and your workplace and your neighborhood, but eventually it may end up in Kenya or Guatemala or the Delta or just a rough work environment where he's going to send you to be the light of Jesus. Jesus said he's the light of the world, but then later on he says your salt, your light, the, the Jesus in you can radiate out, radiate out to a lost and dying world. So even as we go through John chapter 10, it's important for you to realize that if you're a Christian in name only, that's not going on. But if you're a true follower of Jesus, if you believe that he's the risen Savior, Lord, and King, then it changes everything and you'll be on mission for him. You'll be, you will be consumed with the person and work of Jesus. Before we even dive into John chapter 10, I want to show you a quote from Tim Keller, who's a famous pastor and author. And this really holds true, so this may affect how you listen. He said, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. So I want you to think about that. If he really rose from the dead, that changes everything. You're not worshiping a a dead Muhammad or a dead Buddha or a dead Joseph Smith or some dead Pope or some dead pastor. Amen. You're worshiping a risen Savior. So if he, if he really rose, if you really believe that, then you have to accept everything he said. But if he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? So we're glad you're here. We're glad you came. But if you really don't believe he rose from the dead, you're here just to make a grandmama or a mama or a husband or parent happy because you shouldn't do anything he said if he didn't really rise from the dead. So the issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. So even as you hear this, if you don't believe that, then obviously we've been praying, as Andy has said, for a supernatural working, that God would open your eyes and open your heart and give you kingdom ears to hear so that you will indeed believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if he did, and if you really believe that, it changes absolutely everything. I want you to picture as we jump into John chapter 10, right from the beginning, John says, in the beginning was the Word, was Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through Him, everything was created. So He almost takes you back to the beginning of the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it just progresses through the life of Jesus. John the Baptist saying, behold the Lamb of God 
that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus telling Nicodemus, hey, you must be born again. In other words, you got to have that new nature we just pictured in baptism. This isn't just saying a prayer. It isn't joining a church. It isn't saying you're a Christian. 80% of our country says they're a Christian. And we know good and well if we use a different definition and say how many people follow Christ, it's much lower than 80%. So saying you're a Christian really means nothing in, in one way. You can stand in a garage and say you're a car, but guess what? You're not. So you can come to church and say you're a Christian. But are you a follower of Jesus? Are you a Christ follower? He told Nicodemus, you got to be born again. you got to get a new nature. He told the woman at the well that, guess what? You can have some living water. Never thirst again. You're broken, lady. You're searching in all the wrong places. Especially in her case, the old country song of looking for love in all the wrong places was true. She had had five husbands, and the one she was living with now was not her husband. She was looking for love in all the wrong places. And guess what? Even in that, he didn't condemn her. He didn't just pound rocks at her about her darkness. He showed her where the light was. And so if you're here this morning and you say, Brother Jimmy, I'm messed up. You don't know how messed up I am. I will just tell you, you don't know what a great Savior I have. He's all about fixing messed up people because that's the only kind of people he has. He fixed a messed up worship pastor. Amen. Yeah, amen. His wife would say, amen. That means you're okay if your eyes are open and you start to follow King Jesus. And then as he works his way through John, he keeps showing signs and wonders that point to the fact that he has the approval of God and he's even the son of God. And he gets crowds when he starts doing the signs, but boy, once he changes to the message and says, guess what? I am the light of the world. I am the living water. I am the son of God. Then all of a sudden the crowds start to diminish and he starts to preach tougher sermons and kind of make people take a stand. Basically saying, you can't be neutral about me. Not just a teacher, not just a prophet. I am the son of God. And so just like with the risen Savior, there's a division in the world. There's a few people that believe that and follow him. Most people don't believe that and don't follow him, including in this country. But he creates division wherever he goes as he starts to proclaim who he is. And he'll create some division in here as well. And in John chapter 9, last week we saw where he healed a blind man. And the disciples thought he was maybe going to have a theological discussion about whether the blind man had sinned. Even in the womb, they ask him, did this baby sin in the womb or did his parents sin? Why was he born blind? Jesus said, neither one. He was born blind so that the work of God, the majesty, the power, the glory of God can be displayed. And he healed the blind man. And those of you that were here, remember, that created division in the Pharisees. They said, this guy must be a sinner. He was working on the Sabbath. He healed this man on the Sabbath. The blind man said, I don't know all about that, but I know I used to be blind and I can see. And so even now, if you're a true follower of Jesus, you may not know a lot about the Bible yet, and we hope to be a part of fixing that, but if you're truly a follower of Jesus, you can give your testimony. Braxton gave his, both in, in word and in deed. You can give yours. You used to be lost, and now you're found. You used to be blind, and now you see. And that really takes us to John chapter 10. And by the way, don't treat this as a separate story. It's probably the same story as John chapter 9. Because the Pharisees kicked this guy, blind guy out of church, out of the synagogue, because he believed Jesus was the Messiah. The end of that chapter said he, he saw Jesus, he believed Jesus, and he fell down and he worshiped. So we're just continuing the discussion. Jesus is helping the, the religious people, the Pharisees, see that they're really the, the hirelings in this story, the hired workers. They're the thieves. They're the robbers. He's really getting on... Judaism now in some ways we can say he's talking about lost in general but he's also talking specifically about those that were trusting in their religious works trusting in their tradition instead of trusting in Jesus the son of man so have that picture as we start this story in John chapter 10 verse 1 he says truly truly I say to you he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way that man is a thief and a robber. So picture the sheepfold back in this day. Some of you may have been in, on mission trips and seen things similar to this, but a lot of times it was a rock wall. It was definitely some sort of fence that would keep out animals and keep out thieves and keep out robbers. Now this text uses wolves as the predators, but King David, if you remember back to the Psalms, he said things like, hey, when I was a shepherd boy, I used to have to fight off the lion and fight off the bear. So we have all kind of predators that would be after the sheep. 
including thieves and robbers. And so it makes sense that they would build walls that only had one way in and one way out. That at least reduces the chance, or at least you know what you're up against, if you have one entrance and one exit. And that's going to help the ones who are trying to protect the sheep. Verse 2, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. By the way, not all of them were rich enough to have gatekeepers, but many times multiple families would have their sheep in the same pen. They would bring them in at night and all the sheep would be in there. And so they would hire somebody to watch that one door. And so obviously they knew when the true shepherd came in that they would let them in. And then an amazing part of of the sheep, even though they're not given too much credit for being smart animals, uh, the end of verse two says, or end of verse three says, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now that's even a big deal. If you depend on the part of the world you're in, some people, especially in the Western part of the world, tend to drive sheep like they drive cattle. But in the Eastern part of the world, which is the way these people would have heard this story, they lead sheep. And even again, those sheep aren't considered the smartest of animals. They know their shepherd and they know their shepherd's voice. And he knows them and he knows them by name and he calls them out and they follow him. Now we won't get all the way to verse 27, but it basically says the same thing that they He knows them, he hears, we hear his voice, and we follow him. That goes back to what I said earlier about being a follower of Jesus. That's one of those examination questions, and just so you'll know, it is not, examination questions are not bad things. Paul tells us to examine our salvation, make sure we're in the faith. And for a believer, this quick examination leads you right back into a hallelujah time. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God, because we realize that we do hear his voice and we are following him, though we follow him imperfectly. The general bent of our life is to follow him. And if you don't hear his voice, that's cause for concern. Now, again, we don't fully understand on this side of being with him, but before somebody becomes a follower of Jesus, even if they're a professing Christian, but they're not really a follower, this is basically a history book to them. And so just like you may have been bored in world history, trying to pronounce all those weird names of different rulers in the Chang dynasty or something like that, you may be equally bored with the Bible, but it's because you don't hear his voice. It's just a history book to you. And even though we're all in process learning and growing as we go, boy, when you become a true follower of Jesus and the scales come off and the veil is lifted, then all of a sudden you read this as not just a history book. This is the voice of the Lord, my God who's speaking to me and giving me marching orders or marching instructions and communing with me and loving on me and and hugging me and I can rest in him and I can joyously say yes, Lord, to what he asked me to do. It becomes a joy all of a sudden. Verse 5 kind of says it a different way. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. That's kind of another way of examining whether or not we're a follower of Jesus. If you're following the world's voices all the time, if that's your bent of life, every time the next best thing comes around, that's kind of that example of trying to cure your brokenness with those substances, with that immorality, with material things, with relationships, with religion. You're hearing different voices. And if you're following those different voices, it may mean that you don't hear the one true voice, the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And again, there's a reason they didn't understand. They were not his sheep. This was the religious elite that was leaning on the law and traditions. And sadly, it's amazing how many people we talk to, even in America, even in our churches, that if we ask them why they think they'll spend eternity in heaven with Jesus, they'll say, because I've been a pretty good person. My good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. And I think when I get to the judgment, the scales will tip slightly in my favor. The big problem with that is the Bible. That isn't the way it's done in a human court. It's not the way it's done in heaven's court. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we better know the good shepherd. We better listen to his voice. We better follow him and go in and out when he says, go in and out. Are you a follower of Jesus? One way that we do that. One way it's worded is Romans 10, 9. 
If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, it's tempting because of our religious nature to say, well, I've done that. I prayed that prayer when I was seven. I'm in good shape. That's not what that means. Confessing with your mouth Jesus is Lord doesn't mean saying it. It means believing it with your heart. It means believing it like God believes it. It means believing the Word of God that Jesus is God's Son, and He lived a perfect life on this earth that we couldn't live, and He died on the cross paying the price for our sin so that whoever would trust and follow Him would not perish but have eternal life. That's that kind of biblical confession. Jesus is the Son of God, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and rose again in power. Have you confessed Jesus as Lord that way? Because if you have, it goes back to Keller's quote. If you really believe that he lived and died and rose again, it makes no sense to do anything else besides obey him and follow him. And if you're not obeying him and following him, then you don't really believe that he rose again. It's that simple. If we really believe he's king and master, Lord of all, and then he rose again, we will indeed follow him. Once we follow him, some would consider this bad news, but true followers of Jesus, I believe, would consider it good news. Once we follow him, we have a new mission. We have a new purpose. And people are searching for that all over the world. That's why religion in general is so popular. It may be a different religion. It may be Islam. It may be Buddhist. It may be Mormons. It may be within the Christian faith that people are just religious. They're looking for hoops to jump through to try to somehow work their way to God, but he gives us a mission once we're transformed from the inside out that actually brings us joy, even if it takes us to the dangerous and dirty places that have been mentioned. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that it will take you to the dangerous and dirty places. At a minimum, it will take you to uncomfortable places because I don't know any of us in our flesh that like being rejected. And when you start to share your faith, when God leads you to become more and more bold, no matter what your personality is in proclaiming the good news, you will be rejected. Jesus was, and I don't know about you, but just because we've learned a few new methods doesn't mean we got a better plan than Jesus had. He got rejected, we'll be rejected. And we may not love that, but it's part of our mission. Jesus said in Matthew 28, I got all the authority on earth. That's good news, by the way. And then he says, hey, go make disciples baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Again, back to our quote, if he's risen, it makes perfect sense to obey him in all that he's commanded us. Acts 1.8 says it's a little different. When you get the Holy Spirit, in other words, when you get saved, you're going to be my witnesses. It didn't say the staff will be your witnesses. It didn't say the staff and deacons and staff and deacons and teachers. It said you, as a follower of Christ, are going to be his witnesses. And it didn't say just... At church, in fact, this is the gathering of local believers. It means when you get sent out, you're going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So in El Dorado, in Union County, in Arkansas, in the Delta, in the United States, in Guatemala, in Haiti, in Kenya, it means you're going to be with his witnesses there. And for a season, it may be that you give and you pray, but eventually he's probably going to call you to go. Because we go to the dangerous and dirty places. And, and as I heard a, a missionary say the other day, the reason we go to dangerous and dirty places is because all the easy places are gone. We pretty much got all the missionaries in Hawaii we might need. Not quite as many in Iran or China. And by the way, I told you the other day, isn't it just like God that the church is growing fastest in China and Afghanistan? Those are about the two places where it's growing fastest. And you lose your stuff. You lose your family, you lose your job, you lose your freedom, and you may lose your life. How come the church is exploding there? I believe it's because there is no middle class like our country is. What, it's hard to even call it middle class. I believe it's lost people who think they're saved, who aren't willing to jump in and go to the dangerous and dirty places, which might include the, the, the little work site right next to you. It might include the office next door. It might include the kid that's sitting by himself at lunch. He might be asking you to go some places that wouldn't be popular. But we say yes, Lord, because he's given us a mission. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and following, it talks about just like we saw Braxton giving us the picture of being a new creature. It says after that, since you've been reconciled to God, you're going to 
Help other people get reconciled to God. You're going to tell them the good news. And then it says you're actually going to be his ambassador. The way we've described it here before is wherever you go, you plant the Jesus flag. You don't plant the flag of Israel. You don't plant the flag of the United States. You plant the Jesus flag. That is your first identity. It's not as a ball player. It's not as a worker as a plant. It's not as a mom or a dad or a nurse or a teacher. You're a follower of Jesus. That is your identity. Anything else you are comes under that flag. And so even if you're in the army fighting for our country and we appreciate it, and the fact we have freedom to come worship, that's awesome. But even then, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're under the Jesus flag. And that is your first and foremost identity. And that goes for all of us. And Jesus is saying the ones that have those, that identity, the ones he calls by name, they follow him. No matter what their country, no matter what their job, no matter what their family says, they follow King Jesus. We have a new person. We have a new purpose. We have a new mission. But we also have abundant life. This is exciting. And part of the abundant life is that mission. He talks about it starting in verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. By the way, notice how exclusive that is. He did not say, I am a door that'll get you to heaven. That's what our society would have us believe. That's what our media is crying for. If they can find some sissified preacher that will say all roads lead to heaven, they will have them on their show because it gives them great comfort. And if they have somebody, some follower of Jesus that says, no, as much as we love them, that's not God's plan. We're going to see in chapter 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. And they scream, oh, how intolerant, oh, how unloving. And yet, if one of us came up with one pill to cure all forms of cancer, I don't think they would be mad at us. I don't think they would say, well, that's not fair. We got a bunch of different possibilities maybe of curing cancer. You're saying there's just your one pill. If my one pill actually cured all forms of cancer, I would be a hero. And yet here we are. God has given us the one cure that cures our sin sickness. And so it's not tolerant. It's not unloving. It's actually loving to say, hey, God in his love provided a cure. He provided one, but that's a cure. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Just like in the flood, there weren't multiple yachts. There was one way. Noah preached for a long time. Anybody could walk in that way and get saved, and they chose not to. That's not unloving. They had all kinds of opportunities to get on the ark. They chose not to do it. People in our world have all kinds of opportunities to accept the way, the truth, and the life. In this case, to accept the door. Verse 8, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. In Jesus' day, there were false messiahs, and they would often lead their followers to some kind of armed insurrection, and they would die in the process. And there were people who claimed, the Pharisees claimed, that the way to God was through religion and through tradition. Jesus is saying all these other ways, they're, they're thieves, they're robbers. But notice he said, true sheep that he knows by name and he is called and who know his voice don't follow them. And so even today, even in this church, in every church, you need to listen and you need to examine what's said by the scriptures. And you need to go home like the Bereans. Paul commended the Bereans. He said, go check it out in the Word. And they did to make sure everything he said was based on Scripture. No matter what church you're a part of, you examine and make sure it's coming from the Word of God. You don't need people's opinions. We could have a funnier sermon if I gave them to you. You could have a funnier sermon if I gave you, let's see, best not here, if I gave you all the time she messed up at home. You would enjoy. But guess what? You don't need to hear from me. You need to hear from Him. And so Jesus is the exclusive way to God the Father. He is indeed the door. Verse 9, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. There's that abundant life theme coming up. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now the thief here, he's been talking about Pharisees and religious people in Judaism. They're not a good shepherd but he could also, in general, kind of be talking about Satan, who's the orchestrator of the Pharisees, trying to get them to believe religion and tradition. But however you want to put that, the thief, he doesn't come to give life, he comes to take it. 
But Jesus comes that people would have life if they follow him and have it more abundantly. I certainly don't believe, and people take this incorrectly and say, well, that must be kind of a prosperity thing. That must be health and wealth. I get all the money I want. I get perfect relationships. I get healed of all my physical diseases. Well, not only does that not make practical sense, we know better than that, but even scripturally, I've told you before, if you want an interesting topic, you just investigate how the disciples died. It wasn't healthy and wealthy. Pretty obvious. They didn't die healthy. They got speared to death. They got their head cut off. They got bowled. They got beaten. They got crucified upside down. And they had plenty of faith in an all-powerful God. Here's what God promises is that he'll be with us. Jesus says he'll be with us in the storm. Didn't say the storms wouldn't come. He said, I'll be with you in the storms. And yes, if he wants to, he can stand up and say, peace be still. But it may be peace be still when we get to heaven. If he chooses to do it on the earth, that's fine. But he doesn't owe us that. You say, but what about my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory? He will indeed give you everything you need to accomplish his purpose. So whatever it is that you need to accomplish his purpose in life, he'll give you that. But that doesn't make missionaries or disciples who have died any less faithful. It means he gave them what they needed to accomplish their purpose, and then he called them to heaven. And guess what? That's still awesome, and that's still a joy-filled life, and it's still worthy of following our king and our great shepherd. You say, well, what does is, what is the abundant life look like? Well, we don't have time to cover all that, but I think part of it would just be the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. When you become a follower of Jesus, you don't lose your passions and affections. Again, God has not called us to a boring, woe-is-me brand of following Jesus. It's just the opposite. When he starts to fuel your fire, when he starts to stir your passions and affections for the person and work of Jesus, you get so excited you just can't hardly stand it. And I'll admit, I, I, I get convicted at times that I've lost some of it. I remember when I first got saved as a teacher and a coach, literally you couldn't shut me up. I remember back then I was single and one of my mom's biggest concerns is that she was going to see me on the news getting let out of the school. Because I was in a public school and I couldn't shut up. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you that's what it is. And I'm scared I've lost some of it. Because back then, if you came to one of our ball games, you would hear Jesus music blaring. You would see a sign in center field that said, Jesus saves, Romans 10, 9. Now, all around the field, you'd see Domino's Pizza and Ace Hardware and all those signs, you know, we do to make money. Somebody bought one. Some anonymous donor bought one that said, Jesus saves. Romans 10, 9. Why? Because that is our mission. That is our purpose. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have more wisdom than I did. I was a dumb single guy that didn't care if I get let out. But some of you got family and kids, and I understand that. But you get the general point. That ought to be our default is that we're charging for King Jesus. And by the way, that makes it a fun life to live. If you want to ask why most of our students back out of church when they go to college, it's because we haven't shown them an exciting life like this. We've said, come to church and be bored out of your skull and then go home and live like you want to. And they see mom and dad fussing and all the way to the restaurant talking about the music or talking about the sermon in a bad way. And then we wonder why they jump out of church. How about when they leave talking about how awesome Jesus is? Can you believe he spoke through that sorry preacher? That's an incredible God. You can, you can frame it, even a bad sermon, you can frame it some different way to help your kids get excited about Jesus and let them know the mission is really cool. And it really is okay to go to dangerous and dirty places. Instead of you telling them, oh, be careful. Don't, don't rock the boat. Don't sit by that dirty kid in school. Don't help that kid that dropped his book. Don't help him pick up his books. You're going to get made fun of. You're going to be not as popular. You might not get elected to the homecoming court. Well, who cares? How about the court that stands in front of King Jesus? How about caring about that? And when we start to show them that from the time they're a child to the time they graduate, all of a sudden they become bold for Jesus. And yes, they miss out on a date. And yes, they may miss out on a, a team or some kind of award. But they're on fire for Jesus. And they will go to the dangerous and dirty places. And they will see some excitement in this. And you couldn't make them quit being a part of the family of God if you wanted to. Because they see something different. They see something exciting. So God help us for dumbing this down. 
God help us from keeping kids going, bam, when I'm talking about Jesus. I got saved whether you like it or not, bam. I wish we had more kids that would do it in school. I wish we had teachers and nurses and doctors and people in our church. I wish me, when I went to a restaurant, would be able to share and say, hey, I got an answer to that. You gave me a prayer request, and that's awesome, and we're going to pray for you. But guess what? Our Savior's alive. Bam. That would be okay. You say, well, they may get a little nervous about that. Who cares? Do it in love. I'm not talking about beating people over the head with a Bible, but be excited about Jesus. People are drawn to the light. They're not drawn to some kind of gray mush. That's what we're presenting them as a bunch of lukewarm Christianity. And you know what, how Jesus feels about lukewarm Christianity? Most of you know. Go to Revelation. See how he feels about the church at Laodicea. Let me think of a sweet way to say it. Blech. It says it makes him want to throw up. So do you think he's any happier with our brand of lukewarm Christianity? And I'm, I'm pointing at me. Sometimes I'm in that category. Lord, help me get over here where I'm refired up for Jesus. And I don't care what they think, and I don't care what you think. I care what he thinks. And wouldn't you like to be a part of a church that does that? Again, we're going to send some people out of here that don't want to be a part of that. But I believe in a town that it would also attract some people that want to be a part of that. So I want to be known for that as a staff and as a church. You know, and I don't think we would go down to use a metaphor, but if our ship goes down, let it go down like that. I guarantee you there would be some people in here. In fact, I've had somebody tell me those exact words, and I'm like, I don't know. Some of this stuff's kind of hard. I don't know if people will keep coming to hear it. And they said, we go meet under a tree. It's not the end of the world. There will be a group of people that loves this stuff and wants to go meet under a tree. And that's okay, but I'm just optimistic enough, I'm a puppy dog enough to think that there's going to be a decent amount of people in a town of 18,000 that wants to come hear about King Jesus. Not limp-wristed sissy Jesus, but King Jesus, who's going to save the world, who has saved it, who lived and died and rose again, and who's coming back, and who's going to give us resurrection power to live the life. I think there's enough people that want to hear that. And if not, again, we'll have fun. We're going to have fun. Being on mission for him. Do you want to be a part of that? That's what we're inviting you to today. Jesus said that I came to live, I came to die, but I came to rise again as well. Look at verse 11 of John 10. He said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. So he's, he's kind of getting on the Pharisees again. They're supposed to be the leaders. If you want some homework, go look at Ezekiel 34 in the Old Testament. They're jumping on. God's getting on the, the poor leaders that have been fleecing the sheep instead of tending the sheep. Kind of doing the same thing here by Jesus. Verse 13, he flees because he's a hired hand. Doesn't care anything about the sheep. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me. And by the way, the word know there is not intellectual. It's intimate. He knows them, and they know him intimately. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. So he's talking about both the fold of Judaism and just the fold in general of the world, the lost world. He says, I got other sheep that, that aren't part of this, and even other sheep that aren't part of the Jewish Christians. I have Gentiles. I have Samaritans. Every tongue and tribe and people group. And by the way, if you struggle, and I'm not getting on you for the struggle, but if you struggle with only liking to be around and worship people that are just like you, whether that's race or whether that's income or whatever it is, you need to repent. And you need to be aware that in heaven, it's going to be every tongue and tribe and people group that are there worshiping him. And it is our desire that at Emmanuel, every tongue and tribe and people group that's in this area would come and worship. And we can't make them. But that's our desire. And if that's not your desire, we hope you get very uncomfortable. And then we hope that eventually you repent. We're not saying hit the door, but I'm asking you to repent and get on God's page, which is everybody's welcome to come hear the good news that Jesus saves. Because that's his heart, we want it to be our heart. And that may not be natural, and we may not have grown up that way. But guess what? We're all about the supernatural. We're all about a changed heart. We're all about being transformed. So God, if that's not my heart, change it now to where I love all people and I want all people to get saved and I want all people to come and worship the king right here. Verse 
end of verse 16. So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. Not separate, believe it or not, even in the last 20 years. And I'm sure it still exists somewhere. There used to be people that thought that certain races didn't go to heaven. And even in my time of ministry, I've had a person ask me, is there separate heavens? In their case, they were talking about races. And I started to say, well, you don't have to worry about it. Not a factor. <laughs> one shepherd, one flock, two divisions of people, lost and saved. That's the division. And Jesus does cause division. Verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life and take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. God didn't get caught off guard in heaven and going, uh-oh, they're going to kill Jesus. How can I make something good come out of this? No, before the foundation of the world, this was the plan. This was God's plan. This was his rescue plan. The great deliverer planned to send his son, Jesus Christ. The way Isaiah 53 words, it breaks my heart. It should break you parents' heart. It was the will of the Father to crush him. That's how much he loves you. That's an incredible thing. It was the will of the Father to crush him because that's the only way you could be saved. Because you can't be good enough. You can't earn God's favor. But Jesus' perfect life and sacrificial death and victorious resurrection, when you trust in that, that's the plan. That's what gets you saved. On that cruel cross, he died. We, we sang about it, but it didn't stay there. You can go read. You've read it many times probably in Luke 24. When they came to the tomb to anoint his dead body, you remember what the angel said to him? Why in the world are you looking for somebody who's living among the dead? People that are alive don't hang out in tombs. He's alive. Jesus is alive. And remember where we started this message. Tim Keller said, if he's risen, it makes no sense to do anything but obey him. If he hadn't risen, reject him. And so in our invitation on this Easter, that's really what we're inviting you to to biblically believe in a resurrected Lord. If you do, then guess what? You can be a follower of Christ. You can be transformed from the inside out. You can have a new nature. You can have joy. You can have mission. You can have purpose. You can have eternal life. You can have abundant life. We're inviting you to follow him in that way. If not, because Jesus does indeed cause division, the end of this text says that. There was division among the Jews about what Jesus was saying. There will be division in here. Some will leave rejecting this message, may not say it verbally, but they'll go to lunch, they'll go to a family gathering, and they'll be just as lost as when they came in. May have said a prayer, may have joined a church, may have been baptized, but they're not a follower of Jesus. We're inviting you to truly, biblically follow Jesus, the risen Lord. What is your answer to Him? Let's go to Him in prayer. God, we love you. It's exciting to be part of your sheep it's exciting that you know us by name. It's exciting that you call us out. It's exciting that we hear your voice. But God, we're not naive. In this big of a crowd, it just mathematically makes sense that there's some people in here that don't hear the voice of the Lord. That you don't really know their name in a family sense. They're not your sheep. They don't hear your voice. They don't follow you. But God, the good news is they're alive. They have breath. And so today needs to be their day of salvation. So we're going to publicly invite them to come and follow Jesus. And we just pray they would say yes, Lord, to you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.